student at Cornell uh, with career safety. And I'm excited to share some of our research, which is it was um, finding significant acoustic telemetry in the environment <laughs> today to evaluate uh, native fish restoration projects in the finger lakes. stock 
fish, so um, different stocking events in the fall and the summer. Um, in total, we've stocked about 467,000 fish to date. Um, of those, 272 fish were tagged with these small acoustic telemetry transmitters. And I'd also like to mention um, this gauge uh, row here. Um, we release two different age classes of fish uh, across these release cohorts. So we have really small finger length uh, fish that are stocked in the hatchery, as well as these larger one year old fish. So, what did we find? Well, we can track individual tagged fish using this whole lake array. And we can use what are known as time to event models to estimate survival over time. So this is um, a plot of survival of our tagged fish. On the x-axis, we have the number of days from stocking. On the y-axis, we have the survival rate. So that goes from 0 to 1. It's a probability. And uh, as you can see, the survival rate decreases over time. And we used a multi-model uh, approach to develop several different survival models. And what we found is that if you look at individual covariates, so we had um, length and weight measurements, as well as that age that I shared with you upon release, we found that age uh, has the highest support for being the best predictor of juvenile survival in our constructed survival models. So this, I'm not going to get into too many details on the modeling itself, but this is our um, highest supported survival model. And you can see there's a really clear pattern of uh, well, longer term survival with the age one, so the older fish, in contrast to those younger age zero fish. So the blue line, I don't have a word for it. The blue line you can see are the age one fish, that's the fish that are stocked at age one, and the red line are the fish that are stocked as those small fingerlings. Um, we just standardized all those releases, so that time equals zero on the x axis is when the fish were stocked. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, it's the number of days post stocking. So we can standardize all those individual fish and track them across the lake. Um, and we can estimate a survival rate. So based off our um, tracked fish, we estimate that we had about 1% annual survival just for those age one fish. None of the small age zero fish um, survived more than about five months across our array. So we can unpack that in a little more detail. And um, as you can see, we, we observe really high initial mortality, um, particularly of those younger fingerling fish. So our predicted survival rate just of the, at the initial stocking event, so within one day of stocking, we see about 75% uh, mortality of the fingerlings. In contrast, we had about 30% survival, 30% mortality of the older age one fish. So we think that's likely due to a combination of factors. As you know, stocking fish can be physiological, is physiologically stressful. Um, but we also think that there's likely heavy predation. So as I mentioned, this lake supports an abundant lake trout population. And without the gullet, um, we suspect that these cisco are facing a steep predation gauntlet upon release. This is just a picture from an angler who had caught this lake trout uh, two days after the fall stocking and had over 20 cisco. Uh, inside its stomach. But the encouraging note here is that we do observe a few of those age one individuals surviving longer. So it seems that although we document this high initial mortality, perhaps if there's something you can operate on in stocking, that we can maybe increase the chance of getting fewer individuals into that longer term survival regime that you see on the right side of the um, plot. So next I'd like to uh, switch focus to the application of environmental DNA. I know we're in the genetics section, so I'm going to try to relate environmental DNA with our acoustic telemetry work. Um, but before I do that, I'll go back to the telemetry. So we can estimate abundance on um, the number of fish at large in the lake simply by um, multiplying our survival estimates by the number of fish that were stopped. So, we canvassed um, Puka Lake in 2020 at two different, uh, two different times of the year. And we can estimate about how many fish are at the lake um, during those times when we sample E and N. These are the survival plots, the plot on the left. Um, we had a summer stocking event in July of just the age one fish. Um, and in the fall, we, we did, conducted the eDNA survey in July and then October. And in that October, DNA survey, we had stocked um, about 200,000 fingerlings. So if we estimate the number stocked by the, the time-specific survival estimate, um, 
we estimate that in July we had a pretty low density period, maybe 150 fish or so of those H1 fish at large. In contrast to the fall, um, we estimate uh, about 18,000 fish were still at large um, when we sample two weeks after stocking for environmental DNA. And what are our DNA results? Um, so for our July survey, we did not detect any Cisco DNA uh, throughout the lake. And we could map this out and compare our, um, with our uh, tag detections at the same time with acoustic telemetry. So the figure on the right just shows the number of tags Cisco that were detected on the day of our EDA survey. So we did not, we did not um, observe any positive EDA detections. However, we did detect tag fish on our array, particularly around the stocking site, which is in the northwestern part of the lake, as well as midway on the east arm. But just recall, again, this is an expected low density fish period. So we may only have about 150 fish estimated to still be at large throughout the lake. Now, the second part of our survey in uh, October, these are the EDN uh, results. And as you can see, uh, we did a lake-wide survey like in July, but we did have positive EDNA samples, or environmental samples that were positive for Cisco DNA, um, particularly, again, in the stocking site in the Northwest and the confluence area of the lake. So 9 out of 117 total samples amplified for DNA. Um, we also sampled at two different depths, so Cisco or Pelagic, um, relatively deep water species, so we think they're likely to add below the thermocline. So we tried to design our survey to sample up those depths, and we found about 50-50 um, uh, split between um, positive detections at 12 meter and 18 meter sampling depths. Now, if we take these positive eDNA detections and map them out with what we know um, are tagged fish, we can infer where tagged fish were and think about how that relates to where our eDNA were. To we try to get a sense of accuracy in our eDNA, spatially where it was detected. As you can see on the right, um, this plot is just the number of uh, tag detection events across our array. And we primarily detected um, acoustic tag fish uh, only in the western arm of Cuba Lake. And most of those detections occurred again in the stocking site in the northwest corner. So it's pretty apparent we can notice that, you know, that the positive tag detections in the northwest corner are fairly consistent with where we detected the DNA. However, you'll also notice it's quite apparent that we did not detect any tagged fish around the bluff where we had positive EDNA hits. And again, just recall this is a higher density period, so we would expect perhaps about 18,000 fish still at large in the lake, but they're deep water species, so they're still likely um, uh, a relatively low density throughout the lake, but higher density than, than the summer. And we think that the spatial mismatch is probably due to a combination of factors if we're trying to unpack that. Now, um, you'll, you'll see that we only had one receiver that covered the width of the lake at that point, so perhaps our receiver coverage was sparse. But in lakes, lakes are complex systems, so there's a lot going on below the surface, especially at depth. Um, and we think that perhaps eDNA, there's a the potential for particle transport through these complex lake currents. So I'll just uh, uh, share this project that we conducted in the fall, so we were interested in trying to measure currents in the lake just to see if we can come up with some sort of empirical assessment of what, how the currents operate in Cuba Lake. Um, so we built these uh, low-cost Lagrangian drifters and uh, launched them throughout the lake, and they moved quite a bit. So I don't have any results today, but stay tuned for maybe next year for AFS. And just to um, summarize, I'm out of time. Uh, today, I uh, tried to make the case that um, that telemetry in conjunction with eDNA, we have these two different techniques um, that can be useful for um, tracking individual fish across the lake as well as sampling for a species um, that is likely in low densities and occupies um, deep, uh, uh, is a deep water species in the lake. And lastly, um, going back to our survival estimates, one take home from this project that we found is that um, while we document low survival, this uh, useful to know because perhaps there's something we can, um, uh, a technique we can incorporate at stock is to release some larger fish, holding them longer to try to increase their longer terms.